chapter 13, part 4. August just brought in a hat box full of Lily's mom stuff for Lily to look at. I sat up. I could hear my heart thudding. I wondered if August could hear it over there across the room. Ba-boom, ba-boom. In spite of the panic that goes along with it, there's something familiar and strangely comforting about hearing your heart beat like that. August set the box on the bed and removed the lid. I stretched up a little to see inside the box, unable to glimpse anything, though, but white tissue paper turning yellow around the edges. She lifted out a small bundle and peered, peeled away the tissue. Your mother's pocket mirror, she said, holding it up. It was oval-shaped and surrounded by a tortoise frame, no bigger than the palm of my hand. I eased off the bed and slid down onto the floor, where I rested my back against the bed, a little closer than before. August acted like she was waiting for me to reach out and take the mirror. I practically had to sit on my hands. Finally, August lifted it up and peered inside at herself. Circles of light bounced around on the wall behind her. If you look in here, you're going to see your mother's face looking back at you, she said. I will never look in that mirror, I thought. Laying it on the bed, August reached into the hat box and unwrapped a hairbrush with a wooden handle and offered it to me. Before I thought, I took it. The handle felt funny in my hand, cool and smooth-edged, like it had been worn down by excessive holding. I wondered if she'd brushed her hair a hundred strokes a day. As I was about to hand the brush back to August, I saw long, black, wavy hair threaded through the bristles. I brought the brush close to my face and stared at it. My mother's hair. A genuine part of her body. Well, I'll be, August said. I could not take my eyes off of it. It had grown out of her head and now perched there like a thought she had left behind on the brush. I knew then that no matter how hard you tried, no matter how many jars of honey you threw, no matter how much you thought you could leave your mother behind, she would never disappear from the tender places in you. I pressed my back against the bed and felt tears coming. The brush and the hair belonging to Deborah Fontenelle Owens swam in my vision. I handed the brush back to August, who dropped a piece of jewelry into my hand. A gold pin shaped like a whale with a tiny black eye and a spout of rhinestone water coming from its blowhole. She was wearing that pin on her sweater the day she got here, August said. I closed my fingers around it then walked on my knees over to Rosaline's bed and placed it alongside the pocket mirror and the brush, moving them around like I was working on a collage. I used to lay out my Christmas presents on the bed the same way. There'd usually be four whole things that T. Ray had gotten the, the lady at Sylvan Mercantile to pick out for me. Mercantile. Sweater, socks, pajamas, sack of oranges, Merry Christmas. You could bet your life on the gift list. I would arrange them for display in a vertical line, a square, a diagonal line, any kind of configuration to help me feel like they were a picture of love. Configuration, another good vocab word. When I looked up at August, she was pulling a black book from the box. I gave your mother this while she was here. English poetry. I took the book in my hand, leafing through the pages, noticing pencil marks in the margins. Not words, but strange little doodles, spiraling tornadoes, a flock of V's, squigglies with eyes, pots with lids, pots with faces, pots with curly things boiling out, little puddles that, the, that would suddenly give rise to a terrible wave. I was staring at my mother's private miseries, and it made me want to go outside and bury the book in the dirt. Page 42. That's where I came to eight lines by William Blake that she'd underlined, some words twice. O oh, Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night, in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Sounds kind of dark, huh? I closed the book. I wanted the words to flow off me, but they had stuck. My mother was William Blake's rose. I wanted nothing so much as to tell her how sorry I was for being one of the invisible worms that flew in the night. I placed the book on the bed with the other things, then turned back to August while she reached down into the box again, causing the tissue paper to whisper. Tissue paper to whisper. Do you know what type of figurative language that is? 
It's causing an inanimate object, the tissue paper, something that's not human, and it's giving it a humanistic trait, right? Whisper would be something like humor, like a human would do. It's personification. One last thing, she said, and she drew out a small oval picture frame of tarnished silver. When she passed it to me, she held on to my hand for a second. The frame contained a picture of a woman in profile, her head bent toward a little girl who sat in a high chair with a smudge of baby food on the side of her mouth. The woman's hair curled in forty directions, beautiful, like it had just it, like it had just had its hundred strokes. She held the baby spoon in her right hand. Light ga- glazed her face. The little girl wore a bib with a teddy bear on it. A sprig of hair on top of her head was tied with a bow. She lifted one hand toward the woman. Me and my mother. I didn't care about anything on this earth except the way her face was tipped toward mine, our noses just touching, how wide and gorgeous her smile was, like sparklers going off. She had fed me with a tiny spoon. She had rubbed her nose against mine and poured her light on my face. Through the open window, the air smelled like Carolina jasmine, which is the true smell of South Carolina. I walked over and propped my elbows on the sill and breathed as deeply as I could. Behind me, I heard August shift on the cot, the legs squeak, then relax. I looked down at the pitcher, then closed my eyes. I figured May must have made it to heaven and explained to my mother about the sign I wanted, the one that would let me know I was loved. End of chapter 13, which means we have one chapter left. The final chapter, chapter 14. What do you think will happen next? <laughs>